On a clear August afternoon in Montana, a TBM came in to land at a small city airport. Nothing unusual, good weather, light winds, a short flight, but in the last few seconds, the airspeed bled off, the stall warning sounded, and the airplane rolled left and slid off the runway before catching fire. Everyone survived, and that's something to appreciate. But a normal-looking approach, ending in a stall, this low, raises important questions. So today, we're going to walk through what the NTSB found and what this accident teaches us about approach discipline, energy management, and the habits that shape how we fly. This accident started as a routine business flight under Part 91, a TBM 700 or 850, tail number November 860, Charlie Alpha departed Pullman, Washington, headed for Kalispell City Airport in Montana, also known as S-27. On board were the pilot and three passengers on a short hop of less than an hour. The weather was excellent, the visibility was unlimited, and the descent into the valley around Kalispell offered no surprises. But the choice of destination airport matters in this story. Kalispell City Airport sits right in downtown Kalispell, surrounded by low buildings and flat terrain, but it has one major limitation, a 3,600-foot runway with no instrument approaches. On a warm August day, that runway effectively gets even shorter. The temperature at the time of the accident was nearly 30 degrees Celsius. Combine that with a field elevation around 2,900 feet, and your density altitude climbs well above 5,000 feet. For a high-performance single-engine turboprop like a TBM, those conditions shrink margins. The airplane flies a little less responsively, power adds less acceleration, and any loss of airspeed takes more time to recover. These aren't exotic problems, they're just physics. About eight nautical miles to the north sits Glacier Park International Airport, KGPI, featuring a 9,000-foot runway and full instrument procedures. But because the weather was VFR and the business appointment was downtown, the pilot elected to land at the city airport instead. Throughout this video, you'll notice a pattern. Nothing about the environment that day was unsafe on its own. Instead, it was the combination of a short runway, a high density altitude, and an approach profile that didn't match the airplane's performance envelope. When several small factors line up, they can turn a normal landing into a high-risk one. Before we move into the approach itself, it's worth understanding who was flying this airplane. According to the final report, the pilot was a 50-year-old private pilot with an instrument rating. He had more than 1,700 total hours and over 1,200 hours specifically in the TBM. In other words, he was not inexperienced in this make and model. He also flew regularly, logging over 40 hours in the previous 90 days. On paper, this looks like a well-qualified owner pilot with plenty of time and type. Yet the NTSB report and ADSB data from earlier flights reveal something more important. The pilot had developed a personal style of flying, tight, steep, visual approaches into Kalispell City Airport. These patterns were consistently short, quick, and non-stabilized. Not intentionally reckless, but simply the way he had become accustomed to flying this airplane into this airport. This is a common human factor challenge in general aviation. When a pilot repeats a technique many times without incident, the technique starts to feel normal, even if the margins are thin. Over time, that can turn into what some call normalized deviation, where a pilot doesn't think of the pattern as unstable because the approach feels routine. And because nothing bad has happened yet, there is no trigger to reassess the technique. You might ask, how does this happen when the pilot had recurrent training, a valid flight review, and hundreds of hours in the TBM? The answer isn't that anyone was negligent. It's that habits develop quietly. Unless an instructor sees those habits in person, they can go uncorrected for years. In this case, the NTSB concluded that the pilot's pattern style was a long-standing part of his routine, and in the TBM, which is unforgiving at low speeds, that created a persistent risk. The accident sequence began as the TBM was descending into the Kalispell area. The pilot canceled IFR, joined the pattern visually, and set up for runway 13. Winds were light and generally favored the runway. Nothing in the weather complicated the picture, but the complexity came from how the approach was flown. 
The pilot reported entering a left downwind and configuring the airplane early, gear down and approach flaps, a beam the numbers. He noted that this was a typical traffic pattern for him. In practice, it was a compressed pattern that didn't leave much room to stabilize speed, attitude, and descent rate. As the airplane turned base, the pilot allowed the airspeed to slow below the flap extension speed of 122 knots. That isn't necessarily unsafe by itself, but it requires tight energy management. On final, he realized that his glide path was higher than intended, and that he needed to steepen the descent to compensate. With only 3,600 feet of runway available, he reduced power to idle to correct that height. This is where the chain began tightening. Reducing power to idle on a hot day at high density altitude removes the airflow over the wing and tail that helps stabilize the airplane. It also means recovery from any low airspeed condition takes more time. And in a TBM, torque effects become more pronounced when the power is reapplied. According to the pilot, at about 40 feet above the runway, the airplane's oral airspeed caution sounded. That's the airplane telling the pilot, you are entering the lower edge of the envelope. He responded by adding power, but only up to approximately 30% torque. His statement to the NTSB makes his reasoning clear. He was concerned about inducing a torque roll if he added too much power too rapidly. That fear is not unusual for pilots of powerful single-engine turboprops. The TBM can produce strong left-turning tendencies at high power and low speed, but the airplane is designed to handle a properly flown go-around. The key is training to manage the control inputs and staying ahead of the airplane's energy state. The challenge here is that the pilot found himself in a narrow corner of the performance envelope, low speed, low altitude, high density altitude, and only partial power being added. That combination did not arrest the airspeed decay. Moments later, the stall warning activated. A stall warning at 40 feet AGL is effectively a no margin scenario. There is no altitude available to pitch forward, re-establish airflow, and recover. The airplane rolled left sharply, consistent with an aerodynamic stall, and struck the ground just off the runway's edge. The NTSB confirmed in the final report that no mechanical issues contributed to this loss of control. The cause was purely aerodynamic. The airplane reached a point where it could no longer fly. When the TBM reached that critical stalled condition just feet above the ground, the outcome unfolded in only a few seconds. According to both the pilot's statement and the NTSB's reconstruction, the left wing dropped abruptly, consistent with an aerodynamic stall on the backside of the power curve. With almost no altitude to work with, the pilot had no aerodynamic tools left to recover. The airplane's left wingtip struck the terrain first, just left of runway 13. That initial impact marks the moment where the aircraft's trajectory transitioned from flight to ground slide. The nose struck immediately after and momentum carried the aircraft into a near 270 degree rotation. It spun counterclockwise across the ground until coming to rest facing roughly back toward the runway. Security camera footage from the airport, released in the public docket, adds another dimension to the sequence. Although the video is distant and partially obscured, it captures the TBM's slow, unstable arrival and the moment it contacts the parked aircraft on the apron. After sliding off the runway, the TBM collided with four airplanes, a swearing in 300, a Piper, a Cessna 172, and a Cessna Citation jet. Those impacts were not high-speed collisions. Rather, they were the final movements of a heavy airplane with remaining forward momentum. Shortly after the slide ended, a post-impact fire engulfed the TBM. The NTSB report notes that all occupants exited through the main cabin door before the fire grew, and no injuries were reported. The airplane of Ozobidatlane, however, was destroyed by the fire. Investigators did not identify any pre-accident mechanical failures, no anomalies in the engine, and no failures in the control system. Every piece of data, physical evidence, pilot statement, ADSB history, and the final report aligns with a classic stall on approach scenario. One detail that stands out from the wreckage examination is the location of the initial ground scars. They were positioned well left of the runway, which is consistent with an uncommanded left roll due to an aerodynamic stall at very low airspeed. This is exactly what you'd expect when the airflow over the wing can no longer support the airplane. The accident sequence is not complicated, and that's part of what makes it so important from a safety perspective. The airplane didn't fail. The weather didn't deteriorate. The environment didn't produce an unexpected hazard. Instead, this was an event where small deficits in energy management, combined with a tight visual pattern and limited power application, left the pilot without enough margin to avoid a stall. 
The NTSB's final report is direct and concise. The defining event was an aerodynamic stall on short final. The probable cause identifies one critical factor, the pilot's unstable approach, which led to the loss of airspeed and the stall and the impact with terrain. The supporting findings emphasize two elements, the failure to maintain adequate airspeed and the failure to maintain a stable glide path. These findings may seem straightforward, but they reflect deeper themes that the general aviation community encounters frequently. First, stable approaches matter. Whether flying a TBM, a Cirrus, or a Cessna 172, the fundamental requirement on final approach is the same. The airplane must be on the correct glide path at the correct airspeed, in the correct configuration, and with the power settings appropriate for a controlled descent. Deviating from that template increases workload, reduces mental bandwidth, and erodes safety margins. In this case, the approach profile was steep and compressed, consistent with ADSB data from some of the pilot's prior flights. When someone repeats an unstable technique often enough, it starts to feel normal. Over time, the pilot may not even recognize that the technique is unsafe. That's not a judgment about character or professionalism. It's a reminder of how habits can form in any high-skill activity. Repetition can normalize risk. Second, the TBM's performance characteristics played a significant role. High-performance turboprops deliver substantial power, but they also demand precise airspeed control. At low speeds and high power, left-turning tendencies become more aggressive. The pilot's hesitation to add more power because of concerns about torque roll was understandable. But the airplane's performance envelope leaves very little room for indecision when the airspeed approaches stall. The combination of low speed, high density altitude, and partial power application gave the TBM less energy than it needed for recovery. By the time the stall warning sounded, the aircraft was already in a position where a successful go-around was physically impossible. Finally, the environment mattered even though the weather was perfect. A short runway, high density altitude, and a tight visual circuit magnify the consequences of any misjudgment. None of these factors alone caused the accident, but together they contributed to a scenario where the pilot's options became increasingly limited. In the end, the NTSB did not cite any mechanical issues or airframe failures. Every part of the investigation pointed back to one root theme, energy management. When an airplane enters the final 50 feet of an approach without adequate airspeed, there is simply no altitude left to restore lift once the wing stalls. When we look at this accident in its final form, the most useful takeaway is how narrow the line can be between a normal landing and a loss of control. Nothing about this flight was unusual until the last few moments, which is exactly why understanding the underlying patterns matters. For pilots, one of the strongest lessons is the value of recognizing when an approach is developing more workload than expected. A tight pattern, higher than normal descent rate, or the need for rapid corrections are quiet indicators that the approach might not stabilize in time. The earlier those cues are noticed, the easier it is to make a simple, safe change, often just widening the pattern, reducing the rush, or choosing a go-around without hesitation. Another important point is understanding how different environments shift performance margins. High density altitude, short runways, or compressed circuits don't require fear. They simply require intention. When pilots deliberately give themselves more space and more time, they reduce the chance of being cornered into low energy situations. Finally, this accident highlights why recurrent training and honest self-evaluation matter, especially in high performance aircraft. Skills don't fade dramatically. They drift quietly. Regularly practicing go-rounds, reviewing real flights with instructors, and occasionally challenging long-held routines all help ensure that flying habits stay aligned with best practices rather than convenience. The NTSB's findings in this case are clear and straightforward, and that clarity allows all of us in the aviation community to reinforce the same principle. Safe approaches come from discipline, planning, and recognizing early when an approach isn't meeting the standards we intend to fly. With those habits in place, events like this one become far less likely.